Right, so session two, we are very lucky to ha have um, four presenters who are going to give us um, their sort of learning and experience around health engagement at a distance um, in a number of different ways. So I'm very looking very much forward to hearing those presentations. The way we're going to do this is we'll have each, each presenter in turn. They'll present for about 10 minutes, um, 10 minutes tops, hopefully. Um, We'll have a little bit of time for clarification questions, but I'd ask you to hold on for your more substantive questions for the Thanks discussion me. afterwards. You can add your um, questions into the chat and we will also, after we've heard the presenters, go into a, a dialogue Sorry? amongst the presenters and then eventually um, yeah. we'll have questions. Very much looking forward to this. And the first presenter we've got is um, Shane McCracken. Shane has lots of experience of running online engagement events um, and with I'm a scientist get me out of here he's done work around the world and he's going to tell us a little bit about the work in Kenya and Vietnam um, so over to you Shane. Thank you Rob for, for the introduction um, what I would like to talk about is um, our project I'm a scientist get me out of here uh, which uh, um, hopefully you can you can overlook um, talk about where, where it's been in the world um, but what I want to do is rather than just talk too much about the event is just to, to take my eight minutes to highlight some of the advantages of doing online engagement. That might not be so obvious. I mean, there are obvious advantages to it, um, such as when physical meetups are not possible due to pandemics or just because of geography. But what I'd like to do is just cover off some of those other advantages. I'll do that through talking about the event. So first of all, I'm a scientist, get me out of here. It is a student-led online STEM enrichment activity. We've been running the project or variations of it since 2003. And I'm a scientist itself since 2008 has spread from the UK to Ireland, Australia, Malaysia. And you can read the rest of this country, but I'm particularly proud of the work that, that we've been um, able to do in Kenya and Vietnam with uh, welcome partners. The idea originally um, came about um, it to help students feel that science is for them. We, the name, just for those of you who aren't familiar with wonderful British TV, um, borrows its phrasing from a reality TV program called I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here, which was launched at a similar time. So with that time scale in mind, it's fairly obvious that um, we didn't produce the project as a response to COVID-19. Um, it was actually a response to existing power structures that were um, evident in engagement activity, particularly in democratic engagement when we first started, structures and relationships that were all about experts talking to lay people and telling them what they ought to know. So we wanted to disrupt that imbalance in power. And what we found was that by taking the project online and to make it text-based, it really helped us avoid that common scenario of an expert giving a lecture from a stage. Being online back in 2003, certainly young people were more comfortable than many of the adults we were dealing with, and the cultural reference also really helped. So I'm a scientist, since it's online, is a website. Um, this is the Kenyan site. You see there, there's a video. If you get a chance afterwards in the next break, please go have a look at the video there. It's one minute long, and there's a similar one on the uh, Vietnam site. Um, which you'll find just by going to I'm a scientist, which is ends.st. Being student led really helps disrupt that balance in power. So instead of someone giving a lecture, the students decide what they want to know. Being online, we're also able to give those students an element of privacy. We provide them with an anonymous username. They can adapt that to put a display name that can be pseudonymous or completely anonymous or their own name if they like. It gives them the confidence to ask questions, questions that are important to them, um, questions that they feel comfortable asking without worrying about what their classmates, their teachers, their parents think. Particularly when we ran this in Kenya for the first time in 2014, what we saw was a massive outpouring of, of sexual education questions that came through because for many of these students, it was the first time they had access to the internet other than using their parents' smartphones. And that obviously was a place that many of them perhaps didn't feel comfortable asking these types of questions. 
And this pseudonymity, this, this barrier in a way that the internet can provide um, that exists in face-to-face -face thing can be a real benefit, particularly to perhaps some of the less confident people that you want to engage with. I remember um, I was at a live chat visiting a school about a year ago near here, a primary school. Kids were about 10 years old. In the middle of this live chat, the teacher came up to me and she whispered in my ear and she said, something really special is happening here. And I was like, mm, not really, it's just a room full of kids typing away, chatting with these scientists. It happens all the time. And she said, no, 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 that fellow over there, he pointed to this young chap, he said, he's selective mute. He's never spoken to an adult in the school apart from me or his parents. And there he is, just taking part, the same as every other kid in this chat. And that for me is just one way that is perhaps not obvious, but by going online, by being text-based, by providing a medium that is suitable to your audience, you can find ways of helping less confident, shyer kids take part. Another part of the site we, we have, which is um, the ability for, for students to ask questions asynchronously to the scientists, is the issue of being able to take your time before giving an answer. I always, I always and we're probably going to have this situation later if you ask me a question, but I'm going to be put on the spot and I'm going to have to try and answer it. If you put it in chat, I can take my time and answer you more slowly. That can be a real benefit online. You can actually go away and research and make sure you get the right facts as well. Um, each of the scientists taking part in the event creates a profile to tell the students a little bit more about themselves. Uh, one of the nice things about being online is that you can have different levels of information. So here for, for Doris's profile about herself, there is a short answer, which many kids who aren't keen readers might stop at. And then there's the option to read more, where Doris, if you, if you go, and it's a wonderful story Doris has, if you can find it, um, it's a much, much deeper uh, level of information. Also, we find that being online, we're able to involve a lot more scientists to, to show to the students. In a normal zone like here, we have six scientists. In some of the zones we're running, we have 60. That increases the opportunity for, for students to relate to those scientists. Um, you know, you have the, the greater variety of gender, of background, of taste in pop music. Um, whatever it is that those young people relate to in those, in those scientists, you can include more of them. I think it also really helps when you're doing public engagement with, with health researchers, um, is that not everyone is happy doing public engagement. Being a performer, being able to speak in front of a crowd is, is really, really helpful, but that doesn't suit everyone. By being online and text-based, um, you, can, you can involve a wider range of researchers and they feel comfortable um, taking part in that way. The centerpiece of the Under Scientist project is the live chat. This is where a class will book a session with a group of scientists and take part in real time, just asking um, questions, entering into conversations. Incorporates many of those points we talked about before, about pseudonymity, the um, ability for everyone to have an equal voice. On the right, we see the scientists. On this slide, on the left is, is the students. Being online, in a chat room, we're able to have lots and lots of different conversations happening same time. It's, it's a wonderful dynamic occurs to it where the, when you look at the whole chat in one go, it perhaps seems a little bit chaotic. But when you start delving into those conversations where there's a scientist and a small group of students all in the same room around the same table, they're able to have these conversations that if we were sat around um, in a physical conference room, it would just be too much talking across each other. But online, it can really work. But my favorite aspect of the project is this little one here. So you see next to Kai and M's name, there is a number. And that number, 11 in this case, is the number of times that Kai and has had a reply in this chat. We make sure we say to the scientists, make sure you get rid of the zeros. Make sure that everyone, every student participating in this chat has a chance to have their voice heard. And for me, it, it is such an important part of our project, that, that equality of voice that everyone gets. Um, and by being online, that number is only visible to the scientists and the moderators, but it allows them to ensure that everyone, the confident, the less confident, everyone gets to have their voice heard. Being online.
online, but we're also able to keep a, um, a track of um, the conversations um, so that you can go back. We've got transcripts here um, that allow us to, um, to record and very quickly, if we wanted to, to publish those transcripts so that in a, in a, um, a situation that a teacher wants to follow up, they can follow up with their students. It also helps us with our safeguarding issues. I assume I'm running out of time because I haven't actually kept a track of it, unfortunately, Robin, but um, tell me if I do. Um, yeah, you'll need to, to vote, need to wind up fairly soon, Sean. Thanks. That's fine. There are, very, there, are, there are obviously some disadvantages to online engagement, and, and I've spoken about it for particularly with, with people from the Global South, the issues of um, IT access. Yeah, sometimes equipment is scarce, but... Um, Sometimes the internet access is difficult to get hold of. In one school in, in Khalifi, um, yeah, we had to climb up onto the roof to get a phone signal. But by providing uh, mobile dongles, by making it easy for the gatekeepers, the teachers to, to want to take part, they've been very resourceful and were able to, to get their um, students online. It's not perfect in the place where, where IT and internet is, is lacking access but it has some enormous advantages that can make your engagement even more equal for, for everyone involved. And I'll leave it there. Many thanks, Shane. Um, lots of insights there around uh, making sure the range of voices are heard. Um, we're running a little bit short on time, so I'd ask anyone to put any clarification or indeed broader questions into the chat, because we will have time after we've heard from all of our presenters to be able to return to those questions and discuss them further. So I'd now like to uh, invite Anna Thompson to tell us a little bit about um, interactive radio uh, in East Africa, part of her work there with Africa Voices. Thanks very much, Robin. Um, and I think Helen, you're gonna share my uh, presentation. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Anna Thompson um, and I work for an organization called Africa's Voices Foundation, uh, which predominantly works in Kenya and Somalia. Um, next slide, please. Africa's Voices has been working in East Africa for about five years. Um, it's spun out of uh, research at the University of Cambridge initially um, and is premised on the idea of bringing citizen voices into key decision-making processes um, to ensure that, that policy and programming is guided by citizens themselves. This is structured around three core capabilities, um, engagement and media. So we uh, typically use radio and SMS messages to interact with, with people, um, which allows us to create public spaces for discussion, much in the same way that you would with a focus group discussion, but on a much larger scale. This is combined with robust research design and analysis. Um, so all of our, our research is rooted in social science theory. Um, and then uh, the final capability is data and technology. So using innovative, generally low tech solutions that are fit for purpose in uh, East Africa um, to allow us to curate and manage uh, large scale conversations via radio and SMS. Um, and the work that we do is spread across two core thematic areas, citizen evidence for social change, which is kind of uh, gender and social uh, inclusion, um, um, some uh, social and behavioral change, uh, and then governance and accountability, which is more tailored towards supporting uh, NGOs, government development agencies uh, to ensure that their programming is, is guided by the feedback that we receive from citizens via radio. Next slide, please. So COVID-19 evidently has posed a huge problem across the world um, and not least in, in East Africa. Um, when we were shaping our programming to try and respond to COVID in Kenya and Somalia, um, one of the most obvious challenges is that uh, access on the ground was extremely limited, um, uh, while simultaneously there was a, a really strong uh, need for rapid uh, public health information to be delivered uh, on a large scale. 
Um, the health and in, health infrastructure in Kenya and particularly in Somalia is very fragile. Um, and so there was a real time pressure when the pandemic was, was first um, in its sort of nascent phase in, in March uh, to get um, core public health information out as quickly as possible as a preventative me measure. Um, simultaneously, uh, both Kenya and Somalia have a very vibrant low-tech media space. And I think this is one of the um, key challenges is, that was raised in the question that you all answered before this webinar um, was access to the internet um, being very limited in some parts of the world. Um, that is certainly the case in Somalia and to some extent the case in Kenya. However, radio and um, mobile phone penetration is extremely high. And so leveraging that, that existing technology that, uh, that allows us to speak to lots of people across the country um, represents a real opportunity uh, to, to deliver something quite innovative in a short space of time. So combined across all of these three, uh, Helen, if you just click, um, uh, we came up with this, this overall question, how can we reach as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, firstly, to understand their needs um, by asking questions, uh, and secondly, to deliver vital public health information uh, to prevent the spread of COVID. Next slide, please. So this is what we did, and I'm afraid it's a slightly non-user-friendly uh, infographic, uh, but I'm gonna talk you through from left to right. So starting on the left-hand side of the screen, this was our co-design phase. So we worked very closely with um, public health specialists, virologists from the University of Nairobi, um, uh, as well as using the guidelines from WHO to guide the design of the questions that we wanted to ask and the information that we wanted to then send out to, uh, to listeners and citizens in both Kenya and Somalia. Um, based on this, we then uh, broadcast a series of public service announcements on a weekly basis uh, using multiple radio stations uh, across the country. Uh, the PSAs um, both advertised the radio shows that we were going to broadcast later in the week and also invited citizens to send us their questions and comments about COVID via a free SMS short code number, um, which brings us to the brown arrows. So listeners then send us an SMS message in their own words, in their own language, entirely free text um, about COVID, any questions that they wanted to ask, any comments that they had, and then also responding to questions that we were asking via the PSAs uh, and on air. Um, through this process, we also collect demographic information through a series of follow-up SMS messages. This is entirely voluntary and self-reported, uh, but it does allow us to then collect some demographic background information uh, so that when we come to the analysis phase, we're able to look across different demographic groups in different parts of the country to really see what differences there are in perception and understanding of the virus. So once we've started to receive SMS messages, um, all messages are listened to, read, and then responded to by a team of researchers in local languages. Um, all the messages are coded and labeled uh, based on the themes that are coming up in those messages. So for example, if someone sends us a question around the symptoms of COVID-19, that message is then labeled symptoms. Um, through this process, we're also triaging the messages to identify any urgent messages that need a, an immediate or a very rapid response. Uh, we call these escalate messages, and you can see with the red arrows, this is what we're talking about. Uh, these are urgent one-to-one -one conversations um, in which the listener is reporting distress. Um, so for example, someone saying, I think I have COVID. We then ensured through the use of a one-to-one -one SMS platform, that we respond to these messages in real time uh, and, and particularly with the Escalate messages within a 24 hour limit in order to make sure that we're following up with those vulnerable cases. The more general questions and comments around COVID, so people asking about how it's transmitted, people sending us comments on how they feel the government of Kenya is responding and things like that, um, were also responded to by our team of researchers, uh, but with a less kind of pressured time frame. 
We then come to the green arrows, which is this in-depth analysis. So having coded and labeled all of the messages that we receive, we can then take this very rich qualitative data set of, of messages and review um, them quantitatively. So we can start to see the number of messages that we've labeled as symptoms um, and what proportion of, of the total number of messages that we've received that makes up. So say we've received 2000 messages and around 20% of people have sent messages within that that are asking specifically about symptoms. So that then brings us to the yellow arrows at the end of the screen, which is what we do with this information. And that, that was kind of twofold. There was an immediate kind of response to this, which was to um, ensure that the, the uh, public health information that we were then putting out on radio reflected the information needs and gaps that were coming out of the SMS messages um, so that we could start tailoring some of that information more uh, closely. And that became particularly important when we started to see prevalence of rumors and misinformation coming up. So for example, in Somalia, there was a, a big trend of, of messages of people saying that if they took tea without sugar, that would be a cure for COVID. So that was then something that we were addressing on air um, during that weekly show to try and dispel those rumors. And then we were also um, providing regular updates to public health authorities um, and uh, government in Kenya so that they could respond programmatically to some of the, uh, the issues being raised. Uh, and if you click, Helena, I can just give you a sense of the numbers for that. So these are the numbers for um, the Kenya pilot. So we, we did 12 weeks of live radio broadcast. During that time, um, over five, uh, almost five and a half thousand people sent us messages asking questions uh, that we replied to. Um, of these, we had over 300 that we, we uh, labeled as Escalate. So they were provided with much more rapid uh, public health information. Um, and where necessary, we had a case management system in which we linked people that had specific information needs or specific health needs to relevant services. Um, so one example of this is a suicide prevention service. Um, um, and, and throughout that entire process, we sent over 7,000 7, messages. Now in Somalia, we then scaled that up significantly. So Helen, if you click again, uh, you can see the number of messages that we've sent in Somalia is much higher. In order to respond to this uh, higher volume of information, we've triaged the messages further uh, and then sent what we call batch replies. So each message is still read by an individual researcher um, and not a robot. Um, but then when we've coded the message, uh, so for example, a message coded as what are the symptoms of coronavirus, we then send a standardized response to everyone that sent us that message. Next slide, please. I'm rushing through a little bit uh, because uh, I, I, I know I don't have very much time, but I want to give you two examples of the impact that we had. So these two messages on the left-hand side of the screen are real messages that we received, real uh, SMS messages um, that highlighted uh, a, a particular issue that emerged in the research that we were doing in Kenya. So it emerged that uh, the um, Kwan wanted to get tested because they couldn't afford to stay in the quarantine facility. Um, we worked very closely with the uh, public, uh, the, the Ministry for Health in the government, with the government of Kenya to raise this issue. And you can see on the right hand side of the screen, uh, this is a quote from uh, an interview that we had with the permanent secretary for health on one of the shows. Um, uh, responding to this issue that had been raised by citizens via SMS. So you can see this creates a direct social accountability in which government is responding to concerns raised by citizens using this radio and SMS platform. Uh, if you go to the next slide, the second example is taken from Somalia. So when we were initially starting the research that we did in Somalia, it became very apparent very quickly that a lot of people were understanding COVID-19 in religious terms. So framing their response and their understanding in terms of putting their faith in Allah or um, that uh, only people who were non-believers um, could get COVID. And so if you're a good Muslim, you would be safe. Um, and this information became extremely important when we were working with the humanitarian community 
to design their risk communication and community engagement strategies to make sure that what the humanitarian agencies were putting out, the types of information that they were using, was really rooted in this same religious framing. Um, and so recommendations uh, were things like working with local religious leaders in order to bring legitimacy uh, and build trust with the community so that they would then listen and respond to the public health messaging that the humanitarian agencies were putting out. Just to the final slide then, uh, a few lessons learned from this. Um, so low tech solutions, radio and SMS is, is a very effective way of gathering feedback from citizens remotely, particularly when you're not able to do similar activities on the ground, uh, such as household surveys. But there are obviously still limitations to this. Um, there is a, a basic sort of level of literacy that's required to send SMS messages, although obviously people who are listening to the radio uh, can still benefit from the public health information that's going out, even if they can't respond and participate themselves. The other um, element to this is that it's not representative. So everyone who engages with us just does it entirely voluntarily. We don't do any representative sampling. It means that we hear from lots of people, but they tend to be um, uh, more in urban areas and more educated. So it doesn't mean that we come out with a data set at the end of the project that is representative of the entire population. Similarly, this methodology gives us a very clear insight into what communities are talking about on the ground, um, but it doesn't provide detailed enough information for a particular partner organization to be able to de design a project. So it wouldn't allow World Vision in Nyanza, for example, in Kenya, to be able to know the number of people that have COVID-19. So it needs triangulation with other, uh, other information sources. Using the one-to-one -one platform, um, uh, because we make sure that we respond to every person individually, um, using human-to-human -human interaction rather than any kind of artificial intelligence, it does require significant organizational flexibility. Um, and we have very much been learning as we've been going along um, and, and kind of bringing in new ways of working to, to cope with this shift. Um, and then finally, um, when we have been dealing with these escalate questions, um, it became very apparent that linking up with elaborate referral systems is key in order to make sure that people who are vulnerable um, and do have a, a severe health concern can actually reach the service that they need. Um, and an example of this is cases of uh, sexual and gender-based violence that came out through the SMS messaging um, that then needed very tailored uh, and rapid response um, to refer them to the correct services that they could access in their communities. Robin, Thanks. over to you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Anna, for another really rich presentation. I think particularly interesting to see the kind of use of appropriate technology to be as interactive as possible. Um, moving swiftly on, because we are a little bit up against the time now, so I'd ask our presenters if they can to sort of try and keep, keep it um, to the time if they can. Um, uh, next, very pleased to introduce Sophia Collins, who's another speaker with a long experience in working on online engagement projects. And in her case, um, working with parents who've actually worked to sort of design their own experiments and set their own agenda, which I think is really fascinating. So um, over to you, Sophia. Hello. Um, hi. So I am, I, I've got some very low tech slides. Um, here we go. Um, I'm Sophia Collins. That's my Twitter. Um, and I, I used to, in fact, run, um, well, work on, I'm a scientist, get me out of here, the same. Um, but now, more recently, I've been running a project called, I'm a scientist, sorry, no, so called Parenting Science Gang. So I had a baby a few years ago, and as those of you who have had babies know, having a baby is like an earthquake in your life. And your old life is just finished now, and a, a completely new life begins, and you absolutely don't know what you're doing and it's kind of terrifying and um, you, you are kind of looking for uh, things to kind of help you and work out and answer all the questions that you suddenly have because you spend the pregnancy sort of preparing for birth, not really for being a parent in my experience. If other people who've had babies could mention in the chat today, is that, if that's a common experience for everybody, but yeah, you kind of get your baby home from hospital and like, oh my God, what do I do now? Um, so I found myself joining lots of Facebook groups. There are many Facebook groups, and I, I didn't really know before that point. This was in 2013. I didn't really know before this point that 
kind of there were that many Facebook groups, I'll hang out in them. And boy, did that change. Um, so I, I joined kind of Facebook groups for parenting things and Facebook groups were fantastic because you could like visit the Facebook group at three o'clock in the morning when you're, you know, you're awake with your baby and you can't phone them for health visitor and you can't really phone your friends and you can't go to a mom's and toddler's group, frankly, but you can go in the Facebook group and there's probably other people awake because their babies are awake too. And you can search in the group and find out like, this is the problem I have. Oh, somebody already had that problem and discussed it and answered it. And they're a kind of hand-holding kind of support and advice source for you. And they're also a place to kind of hang out and make jokes and, and sort of, so people are really getting kind of, support in in these groups but also it's something you can do without leaving your house and it's pretty low tech um and it's mainly just using facebook and people are, you facebook is in the uk is the most commonly used social media platform this is another low tech slide here can you see that yeah if you lift them up a bit higher, higher. so it's basically Um, in the UK and it'll be slightly different for different countries. I know um, I was doing part of a project in Kenya and their WhatsApp is much more common but you know so you'll know for your local context but these are the places people are and you know the number one rule of engagement is go where people are rather than trying to drag them to come to you. Um, so I ended up setting up, uh, so this is all a preamble to say I, I decided to run a project using Facebook groups for parents um, particularly parents of young children, because this is the period in your life when you kind of suddenly need a load of new information and you don't have access to it. And you don't have a lot of time and you can't go to real world events because you're at home with your baby. Um, so what we did with Parenting Science Gang was we, we set up Facebook groups. We, we were in kind of partnerships with existing large Facebook groups. And some of these groups had like 40,000 members. Um, so, and these groups had kind of uh, a particular issues in common or things that they were interested in. So some of them were breastfeeding support groups, some of them were different kind of issues. And um, so we, we ran eight different groups and um, those groups between them, <laughs> those groups between them ran um, uh, seven different experiments. It was a kind of radical co-creation model. So the groups chose, the, they came up with questions that they wanted answers to. Um, that they felt science hadn't kind of provided those answers and they um uh, and they, they sort of returned that together into actual research questions and then collaboration in collaboration with scientists they designed their own experiments to answer those questions and then they ran those experiments and then we did you know we, we produced knowledge we, we've produced so far four different papers in scientific journals and, and there's more kind of on the way hopefully the research was things from um uh, like one one was about what's the composition of breast milk produced for older children because there was no research on that. So we got 136 breastfeeding mothers all came to Charing Cross Hospital in London and expressed breast milk and, and got it tested in a mass spectrometer. And then at the other, kind of other end of things, one group were women with a kind of high BMI who had issues about the way they, the, the care they'd experienced in pregnancy and, and birth. And they did, um, kind of surveys and interviews to investigate the experience, whether their experiences were typical and, and how um, women with high BMIs had experienced their care in pregnancy and, and how that kind of changed their behavior in, in future pregnancies. So a real massive range of, um, of, of different sorts of experiment, but it was just whatever those groups wanted to know. And it was, we called it radical co-creation or user-led citizen science, really, really driven by them, totally in power on the IAPT um, spectrum. Um, and so that's, that's, that's sort of where my whistle stop talk of Parenting Science Gang. Now, the, the thing that I've been asked to talk about in particular, the challenge I've been asked to address was the um, how to get the human touch in, in online engagement. So there's these two real takeaways I want to communicate here, and then I'm going to talk a bit about that. First one is, I'd like everyone to stop thinking of online engagement as some kind of second best that we're just doing because of COVID. Um, it, it's a thing in itself, and it has really a lot of advantages. Like, you know, our second, obviously, the advantages that Shane was talking about. There, there's a lot of groups for whom online is, is brilliant and much better than, than doing real world engagement. Parents of small children, it's very difficult for parents of small children to 
kind of get out of the house and go to events unless they're a child focused event. Um, but when their kids are asleep in the evening, you know, they can do stuff online, but they can't go out and go to a meeting or something um, unless they can get a babysitter, but often you can't. Um, people in rural areas who are a long way from where the meetings that you might run are, uh, people who are of various kind of mobility disabilities, you know, who can't, you know, it's difficult for them to come to physical events, but they can do stuff online. Um, people who are time poor. So we set up Parenting Science Gang so that people could kind of come and hang out in the Facebook group and they could spend 10 minutes there if they, if that's all they had, or they could spend half an hour, they could do more. But if you've only got half an hour, you don't want to spend like an hour traveling to a venue and parking and, and stuff and, and doing a thing and then coming back. Whereas online stuff, you can just kind of log in and do whatever you, you know, spend whatever time you've got. Um, so there's, I think there's a lot of advantages to doing online. We don't have to think of it as second best. Um, and this is my, my other second kind of key point is, can you see that? Yep. You don't make a film by filming a child from a bus seat in the house. I'd really like people to kind of pause before they try and design some sort of virtual engagement activity and think, right, what's the key things we're trying to achieve here? Not what was our offline version trying to do and then trying to kind of replicate that in an exact way online. Think about your aim and try and achieve the end, you know, because I think often, I mean, you know, this meeting is great. There's a real place for Zoom meetings, but not everything has to be a Zoom meeting. If you were originally trying to do an, an in-person meeting, you don't have to kind of jump straight to doing a, a Zoom meeting online. You know, we had very little face-to-face -face stuff in Parenting Science Gang, but it stretched over two years and people were kind of doing little and often. And they really did develop relationships in those groups. But people, you know, this is what people, a lot of people spent hours of every day on Facebook, you know. So we were kind of harnessing that and getting them to do something they were already doing. Um, you don't have to be making people turn up to your Zoom meetings and, oh shit, sorry. <laughs> right, we're nearly out of time. Okay, um, human touch. The key things, this research on developing friendships and two of the key parts of developing friendships is repeated opportunities to interact and opportunities for mutual self-disclosure. Now, in something like Facebook groups and another kind of over spread over time, um, online activities you can make those opportunities for repeated interaction and when you know in our group people were talking about their experiences of birth and vaginal tears and, and stuff you know like that. there was opportunities for mutual self-disclosure and it's entirely possible to do that in an online um, setting and I know two different people who met people on in the early 90s on Usenet and traveled to the other side of the world to meet those people in person and then got married to them. two different people <laughs> like not not the two people didn't get married to each other they got married to two. Um, and that was in the early 90s so for 30 years now almost people have been developing genuine relationships online um, so we should all kind of stop acting like it's, a, it's it's I think part of the problem the issue is that engagement people tend to be good people people so they do a lot of their stuff in person so some people have found it quite difficult to transfer to online, but you know, we can develop relationships online, honestly, I promise you. And, and I just want to finish with two little quotes from Parenting Science Gang. Hang on, can we see that? Just to show something about, oh, is that backwards for you? Or no, you just, no, 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 no. Okay, right, okay. So, um, and, and that, that, I love that one, but I felt like part of the movement. People did genuinely develop a real relationship with the And the other one is, oh, 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 sorry, this isn't there. There we go. That's it. Okay. And none of that gave me a sense of being able to be involved in something, you know, while I was stuck at home with children. These things are important, giving people these opportunities are important. Okay, I think that's me. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks ever so much, Sophia. Lots of insights there and lots of resonance in the chat for your um, saying that don't not to see online as second best and to sort of work to the best uh, of what you've got really. So thanks again for that. People do add uh, into the chat questions, observations for Sophia yeah, and we will come back to, to those. Any questions. 
Yep. Um, and we'll come back to those in the broader discussion. So now I'm going to hand over to um, Dinesh Deokata, who's going to talk about digital reflections on the pandemic in Nepal. Over to you, Dinesh. Uh, thank you. Um, so good, well, good evening here. Uh, my talk to you today is about uh, how we are sort of working from a distance, uh, trying to gather we call it digital diaries here, but they are like video stories of uh, vulnerable Nepali people uh, and how they're coping with the difficulties brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so it's a project funded by the Wellcome Trust and under the social sciences and public engagement action research done in, uh, and it's been done in partnership with Ukru in Vietnam and also being run simultaneously in, in Vietnam and Indonesia. And of course, led by the wonderful Mary Chambers who is somewhere in this mesh right now. <clears throat> um, so for this engagement, we sought contributions uh, from a wide range of radio community here in Nepal. Um, I mean, if the contributors, they are required to film their diaries and somehow deliver this footage to us for editing. Uh, but mind you, uh, uh, most of the country is in like, it's, it's like a near complete lockdown and there's severe limitations uh, of movements. Uh, and the virus is endemic in some of the locations that we're working in. So much so that uh, some people are even wary to move around in their own neighborhoods. So I'll just use the word contributors here for those who are sort of taking part, uh, sharing their video stories. Um, <clears throat> so this is the scenario. Uh, some of the contributors might have a digital camera like in a smartphone, but not all of them do. Um, and if they don't, they need to find someone like a friend or a family who has won and film on their behalf. Uh, some might not have access uh, to the internet. So why have a smartphone, you might ask. Uh, I mean, some live, some live uh, a few hours walk from the nearest roadhead. So contacting them for updates uh, sometimes can be an impossible task. Um, and none of them have any prior, well, not well, one of them uh, had some experience, but most, none of them had any prior experience in such an exercise. So uh, I think we've made it very easy for ourselves. Uh, so I'd like to give you an idea of the kinds of stories that are coming in, but I think it might take up too much time. Uh, but if you're interested, I can answer them in the question answer session later. And, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, share some of these digital videos with you sometime in the future. Um, so just coming to the point, uh, how are we improvising in order to conduct this activity uh, from a distance. Um, how are we finding these contributors, you know? Uh, While well, we can't literally physically move around to find them. Um, and how do we convince people to share their experiences uh, and also to film themselves? Because we can't even meet them. Um, and, and how do we convince them, very importantly, uh, that our objectives are benign and that, you know, it's not going to, this activity uh, will not bring them harm later on because we've never even met them. We might never, never even meet them. So, so this is how we are doing. I'll just give you this uh, short points. So, uh, so we are falling back. Uh, we're going back to our old connections, people we've worked, organizations that, that we've worked for before. Uh, so these, are, these could be individuals, they can be organizations, but, uh, but who are trusted by the communities. And uh, importantly, uh, Who's sort of working style like we are familiar with. Um, so in Nepal, we have here, uh, you know, they work for organizations and we call them uh, social mobilizers. Uh, maybe you might have uh, a different name for that in your country, but a social mobilizer is one who works uh, directly with the community, sort of at the ground level. Um, so they are people from within the community sort of who know uh, nearly each and every household, Maybe the status of the family is there. So, so they are a familiar face, uh, you know, who help in implementing project object objectives. Um, so we, number one, we caught hold of them and we've worked with a number of them before and a lot of trusted people. So it's like one of the hardest part of working from a distance, uh, I think is be, it's, it's, it's trying to assure people about our intentions. I mean, uh, you know, people, they can be naturally wary uh, about how the video could be used. You know? uh, these days, there's, uh, we see so much misuse and distortions online on different social media platforms. 
Um, so, I mean, never use the word, you know, the two words, trust me, because <laughs> I think that can like set up a lot of alarm bells in a, a lot of people's minds. Um, so, so here comes a social mobilizer, like he or she is a trusted face uh, and they would identify people for us and, and they would explain our intentions because we briefed them properly before. So they would uh, explain our intentions uh, and also do the follow-up uh, follow work regards the filming, I mean, however long it took. Uh, so just coming back, the end objective of, of this story, this digital story collection, uh, is to take these films uh, back to the communities, you know, later on, uh, later on, uh, where it was filmed, or to similar other communities, so it's sort of as a, uh, a reflection of this time, um, and to interact on what might have made them vulnerable. You know, we can, these vulnerabilities will come out in the film. So it's, it's like a uh, interaction piece where, you know, uh, it's like, uh, uh, what's the, well, something to start off a conversation. Um, so these interactions in the future will be conducted by the same uh, social mobilizers who are involved in gathering these stories. So, I mean, literally speaking, they'll be the ones holding up this, this uh, digital mirror, let's say, for reflections. So it is this future involvement that gives them uh, like a direct ownership of this project and, and thus their dedicated involvement uh, in this, you know, in this collection phase. So social mobilizer was one, these people who live within the community. So number two, uh, we made use of journalists. So just like social mobilizers, you know, uh, local journalists are familiar with the communities. Um, I'm not necessarily trusted, uh, but we were in touch with a couple of them and they were of invaluable help, sort of in finding uh, or helping us find uh, contributors, you know, who were willing to share their stories. Um, so remotely from a distance, it's, it's very hard to explain the concept of a film storytelling uh, to someone without experience. But if you get hold of a journalist, the journalists sort of grasp it quicker because I mean, like the stories are of writing stories, it's their career. So, uh, so we were lucky in a sense that uh, one of the journalists, uh, she happens to be the only female journalist in the district, had her own story, her own difficulties of this time, and she wanted to contribute. So, so she contributed her story, but in turn, she also, uh, I don't know, recruited is the wrong word, but but uh, found other contributors. And she was able to uh, show how she did her filming to them, show the kinds of topics she was covering, and, and she could explain it herself. So like journalists, in term, in, at times like these, when you have no one else, a few people to turn to, uh, journalists have mobility, they have the permission from the authorities to move around. And we were, law, uh, we were able to do a lot of our uh, findings, research, and follow up with their help. So, uh, I mean, if you are in the same position that we are at the moment, you know, where it's impossible to go anywhere, uh, you should keep local journalists in mind because uh, by nature, uh, journalists can be resourceful, inquisitive also, uh, and they can be a sort of eyes, ears, voice on the ground. So uh, number three, um, this might come as a surprise for you, uh, ambulance drivers or ambulance, just ambulance drivers. Um, so how is it remotely connected, you might ask. Um, so, so ambulance drivers are like, uh, they are like journalists, you know, uh, they have the permission to move around. Uh, it's just the nature of their work. Uh, uh, so, so, I mean, during this lockdown, when uh, all like short haul, long haul transportation, and all flights were, have been suspended, still suspended, uh, and many in Nepal were sort of bending the rules by uh, making their journeys in these in this hired ambulances. So, so we recruited some ambulance drivers as, as our messengers. Uh, we identified those ambulance drivers that sort of regularly uh, serviced areas where uh, our contributors are located. Uh, yeah, but just let me be clear, we were, clear, <laughs> we were not hiring these ambulances, uh, but when these ambulance drivers happened, uh, to be in a particular area, uh, or when they when they contacted us, telling us where they would be, um, you know, we somehow manage these exchanges. So uh, we relied on them not only to deliver our messages, also pass on instructions, 
but also help us gather uh, some of the footage from the contributors. Like, you know, we used to send uh, empty memory cards from here, and the contributor, uh, the memory card that she filmed, or he filmed, they would, we'd sort of exchange it via the ambulance drivers. So they served as a messengers and a, and a couriers also in a way. Uh, so the other way uh, that we worked, which was, I think, one of the convenient ways, was we, uh, was over Viber and WhatsApp. But again, it depends on the connectivity, and we have terrible connectivity in Nepal in a lot of the mountain areas, especially like hill areas. But Viber and WhatsApp, where it worked, uh, was seamless. Uh, I mean, they are instantaneous. I mean, we can view the materials immediately. Uh, and the best thing about Viber and, and WhatsApp was um, um, we could build a connection with the contributors you know, more effectively because uh, we could share our own photos, uh, we could hold video discussions with them, uh, talk about ourselves, they would talk about them themselves. So, and they could, you know, they could really, we could, they could, they could see us uh, put a face to, to who we were. Uh, so I think this way we understood each other better and also, uh, Build this connection, which led to trust, and just this face-to-face -face thing. Uh, the other number five was personal networks. Uh, in times like these, they are great help. So for stories or contribu contributors from, uh, especially from in and around uh, in and around Kathmandu, uh, that's where I'm located. So suggestions from friends and colleagues are very helpful, and we found some really really powerful stories. <clears throat> so. Uh, a big challenge for us in this entire exercise uh, was <laughs> how to keep the contributors motivated, you know, because they had to keep on with the filming, uh, to be inclined to carry on with the filming. Because um, we asked them to share so much of their lives, well, as much of their lives as possible. But I mean, it can be tedious, uh, tiresome sometimes, especially like, you know, when you are not aware of um, how, how to go about it. Uh, so we did provide financial financial compensation for the time. I think it was just, just there enough. Uh, There's only a token amount, but it was a motivating factor for some. Uh, and I also believe that it did help a lot of uh, a lot of households, especially those having a really hard time. So I mean, we were extremely grateful uh, for the participants in, in taking part in this. And when we do compile everything. Uh, I mean, I personally would take great satisfaction in taking these stories, mainly taking these stories back to these communities, uh, showing it back to the individuals who share these experiences. Um, and not just in Nepal, but around the world. And I think these our contributors would like that. Sorry to interrupt, um, Inesh, but you'll need to wind up now if you can. One minute. Okay, so right now uh, we have to think slightly different uh, at the times like these and sort of be innovative and, and improvise and I think use whatever means that comes closest to sort of fulfilling our objective from a distance. Uh, I mean, I wish phone, internet work well in places, but unfortunately, uh, not the case here in Nepal, so it's much harder to get things done. Uh, so this time we've had to rely entirely, mostly on people. Some people we knew, some people we didn't know at the time, and some people we still don't know, but we are getting contributions from them. So, if you ask me, uh, it's been an interesting experience. Thank you. Thanks, Dinesh, for another brilliant presentation. I think really interesting to look at those relational dynamics and trust and how important that is to gathering sort of meaningful, incredible stories. So, thanks again. Folks, we're, we're very much up against the clock, as is often the case on these meetings. Um, what we were intending to do was have a bit of a panel discussion um, between our four presenters, and I would invite them um, to, to sort of be ready to ask questions of each other and join in a discussion. But I think we're just going to open it out more broadly and invite you all to put questions in the chat. Or indeed, if you would like to ask a question yourself, you can use the raise a hand function on Zoom. If you move your cursor down to the participants tab, you should be able to raise your hand and we can invite you to, to ask the question yourself. Um, needless to say, there's lots that we'll be able to sort of pick up on afterwards on on, on Mesh. There's been a lively chat going on throughout those discussions, uh, including lots of um, people being really into the projects and saying how great they are. Um, but I will leave it at that and um, invite 
perhaps the panelists would like, if, I don't know whether any of the panelists have got a question for each other while our participants have time to put questions in the chat or raise their hands. Uh, I have one for Anna. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, so because uh, you were talking about how you're doing, uh, you know, connecting people with SMS. Because uh, even for us, uh, trying to find people, we sometimes have to rely on phones. But it's sometimes it's it's very difficult to get, well, their numbers, so to speak. So how do you go about uh, finding these people, you know, getting their numbers? How are you uh, spreading the word? Because you need to collect these numbers from them get in touch how do you do it yeah i mean that's the beauty of working with radio is that you you start with the radio broadcast and invite people to participate through that and as soon as someone sends us a message in response to either the public service announcements or if they're listening to the show on air we're then able to communicate with them one on one so the the methodology really works as an interaction between radio and sms um, and what that also has allowed us to do is over time build up a contact group of people who previously participated with us. So when we're starting a new project, we're able to message the people that we have in that list and say, we have a new radio series coming up. Send us your thoughts on whatever question we're discussing. Thank you. Any other of the panelists wanted to throw in a question? And indeed, we've also got um, Ragil and Rosalind, who we were hoping that would be able to join the panel. I don't know whether either of you have got a particular question for our panelists. Uh, yes, Rob, thank you. Uh, hi, guys. I have a, I, actually, I have two questions. It's, a, it's quite a general question. The first is like, just before you start the, any, any engagement and any, in any platform you use, how actually you invite the people to engage in your activity? I'm talking about not, not us as a scientist, but the people, like how to invite the people to participate in, in the Facebook page or in the radio, how you info, you know, how, to in, how you introduce the, uh, your project or your activity to them, that's the first. The second is, in, in my country, in Indonesia, uh, there's so many, engagement running by the organizations. People get it hectic with the any webinar, seminars, uh, you know, any activities involved by the COVID-19. What, what should we do? I mean, like if we start to engage, if we start to plan or to make or to create a new one, when the people already start to feel enough, about that, what, what do you think about how, how what's your tips uh, just to ensure that your project is still going on, but not the people not fed up with any engagement ha happen now? Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Does any of our panelists want to respond to that one? I think Sophia. Sophia, sorry. Yeah, this <laughs> right, um, uh, the, the number one thing I would say is this question comes up a lot. It's work. If you decide who your audience is, who are the public you are trying to reach, and then you just work out where they already are and go there. Um, because it's very difficult to get people randomly to come to your university's webpage or come to a, a talk at the, you know, on the university or, or something like that. But if you work out where they actually are and go there, I mean, so my audience for Parenting Science Camp, they were in these parenting groups. So I went and talked to, well, I, I mean, went, I, online I talked to the admins of those parenting groups and said you know would you be okay you know would you be interested in partnering on this and and that's what we did um, and and for any group you can think of if you think where they are already and, and talk to the people that, that that can kind of introduce you to them yeah, rather than just expecting that they can kind of come to you thanks Sophia and we're getting resonance in the chat for that um, Shane you had a contribution I'd, I'd go one step further than Sapphire and say you also need to give people a purpose. <laughs> um, you've got to give people a reason for wanting to take part in your engagement. Just your I desire. I took that to... as red. <laughs> but yeah, go on, sorry. <laughs> Fire and I, obviously, as you know, go back a long way. We could be bickering here for ages. Um, it, is to make sure there's a, there's a clear purpose for, for the engagement. And with ours, um, you know, teachers are very clear that they want to show students what it's like to be a scientist and show diversity of science. 
But that's not good enough for the students, which is why the students get to vote for a scientist to win. They get to decide where 500 pounds gets spent. And that's, that provides a purpose for those students. And so always make sure your purpose is clear to all parts of your audience. In terms of fatigue of engagement, I, I don't, I think maybe the purpose answer, you know, is there as well, that if you have a purpose to it, then the fatigue won't seem so bad. But I, I do think there is a lot of fatigue and we've been running I'm a Scientist in the UK over the lockdown period. And COVID, yes, it was a popular topic, but still kids wanted to talk about science. They wanted to know what it was like to be a scientist just as much as, as the coronavirus issue. Thanks, Shane. Anna, did you want to respond as well? Yeah, on the fatigue question, um, I think it's a, it's a real challenge. Um, I would say trying to coordinate with other organizations that are also gathering citizen feedback and community engagement and trying to link up so that you don't have multiple organizations asking the same questions or um, targeting the same groups of people over and over again. One of the challenges in Somalia is that um, displaced people represent a, a static, quite easily accessible population. And so they are constantly being asked questions by different organizations, um, uh, which could be avoided by the organizations actually talking to each other and trying to get the information that way. Um, rather than duplicating efforts. So connect as much as possible with what's existing um, structurally with other organizations. Thanks, Anna. Um, Rosalind, did you want to, to come in with a question? Uh, not, thank you very much, not really. Maybe mine will be more of a learning. Okay. Just to share some of the learnings we've had from our end. Uh, we've ha we have a very sustained radio program uh, part of the public engagements, a tool that we use for public engagement, and that we, 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 we already have it structured. Uh, but one of the things I'll just add on that will be um, something that Anna mentioned, that uh, we already have uh, a lot of penetration of radio in our community, community radio. We are looking at a position whereby you find that our audience are fragmented. So just to, to, to like just to touch on that is that one of the learnings that we've had from our engagement will be that the best thing to do is to use more media because you find that once you have people fragmented, the audience fragmented, you want to reach the, a bigger community. And so for us, one of the key learnings has been that you just don't use one particular radio station. You look at probably two or three, but then have the same dialogue running. You have it sustained. And uh, by so doing, you're sure, you're kind of sure that you'll probably get a bigger audience, a wider and a diverse audience. And that is something that we are probably implementing in our next phase of radio. And um, something that I think that was Rajil who also asked that uh, how to reach to people. One of the things we have done is that um, we have a lot of uh, promotion. We promote the program. We have a weekly program, but then we run features that run like three days before the real day, the live program, which basically just gives a sneak preview of what will be running in the program. But then at the end of it all, again, we have several um, groups of people who we engage who we engage with. So these are people who will actually more or less work as a as an evaluation, monitoring and evaluation of the program. They are clear representation of the community. They, they are more like fan club members, they're actually fan club members. And they listen to radio stations, particularly the radio station that probably we are running the show on. So they give us views from the community, kind of a representation of what the audience will want to hear. So when you're running a program, you're actually structuring your program around that kind of a topic. This is what we will want to hear about health research. Uh, and we go back to them. For us, we do that like every after three months, having quarterly meetings with them and just to see the impact of the radio program, get feedback, and again, ask them, how will you, uh, what will be your advice on how we can better our program? So basically, we use them as a monitoring and evaluation. That is maybe one of the questions I'll just want to ask and how she does her monitoring and evaluation, because yes, we do this, but we want to get a more vibrant uh, process of evaluation so that as we move on, we know that uh, we're having an impact on, on the program. And lastly, we realized that in our health research uh, programs, there are certain topics that uh, you find a bit technical for our lay audience. And what we do is just bringing in an element of drama. Basically, at the very beginning of the program, we have a short radio drama that just simplifies the whole topic as, as challenging as it might be for our audience to listen. 
And so during the live program, even the researchers in the studio, they keep referring back to, to the drama, the five minute drama, what Mr. Who said or did, and this is how this should be done. And basically just breaking down the science in, in a simple manner. And when now we come to the second hour and people start calling in, they even refer to the actors and that means that somehow it is easily understood. So those are just some of the learnings using more than one radio station, using community representatives to, to guide you or, or on, the, on the structuring and basically also just using elements that will make the, the harder topics to be easily understood. Yeah. Thanks, Rosalind. Um, this building on, there's a lively thread going on in the chat around kind of meeting people where they are and what that might be, but a related question, which is sort of primarily directed at Anna, is around local languages and the role of local languages in, in doing work in terms of what people are comfortable with and how they'll express what they want to express. So I don't know whether you could say a little bit about how you've addressed that in your project. Yeah, so one of the sort of fundamentals of what we're doing is to make sure that we're broadcasting in local language all the time. Um, and so we have a team of uh, uh, local um, researchers who speak the local language. Um, so in the case of Somalia, Somali speakers, but also some of the more minority di uh, dialects. Um, and then in Kenya, predominantly, we're working in Swahili. Um, but where we've done more tailored shows in particular locations, uh, we've worked in, in other, other local languages. Um, so actually the majority of the data collection and data analysis is done in local languages and then um, a, a subset is translated um, so that we can present to wider audiences. Thanks. And I think, Sophia, you had a comment? Oh, your mic's off, uh, Sophia. Sorry, I was just typing an answer to, to Tom about, do you want me to say it? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were waving to say um, you had a contribution. Oh, That's fine. Um, sadly, we're right out of time, folks. Um, it's been a really rich discussion, and I think um, I'm very glad that we're going to be able to hopefully carry on some of the strands of conversation on MESH, because there's been a lively chat going, and there's, there's loads more insight to share, and it's a very rich group of people, I think. Um, I'd like to um, just draw your attention to that space on MESH. So if we draw this panel discussion to a close and Helena, if you could give us the, the kind of slide about where people can go on MESH to carry on the conversation, um, that would be great. Um, I should also say there are a number of ways we can carry on the conversation. One is um, going to MESH as it's highlighted there. Um, and I will, I will ask, I'll say a little bit more, more about that in a minute. I think all his, um, all his conversation and her, uh, her board will also be open. So some of the conversation will also carry on there and we will try and gather resources. And um, I, I think we've had it said in the chat that recording of the session and various resources will be gathered together on mesh. Um, I just wanted to also ask, um, Helen Latcham, who's the MESH coordinator and who kind of designed this event, just to sort of say hello and just say a little bit about that follow-up before we close. Sure, uh, thanks Robin. Um, and thank you everybody um, for, for joining today and thank you particularly for the speakers. They've been um, absolutely fascinating and it's a real privilege for you to share your work. So as Robin said, I'm Helen Latcham, um, I'm the MESH manager. So um, I, I not, don't want to keep you for much longer, but just to say, um, join MESH. Um, it's free, it's quick, it's easy to join. You can participate in the discussion group and really get involved in the network. Um, there's the link, we'll be putting up a lot more resources. Um, and I've seen lots of you talking about some of your work in the chat, and I'd really like it if you could sort of post some more links and some more information in the discussion group so people can really find out more about all the different work everyone's doing. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's a feedback evaluation form as well, which I'd really like you to complete to talk about what you thought about the event. Um, yeah, and get involved and get in contact with us. So thanks, Robin. Thanks, Helen. And um, yeah, Helena has, Helena has just put the link to that evaluation in the chat. So it's there um, if you want to access that and give us your feedback. It's always, um, as Ola said earlier, these things are always evolving. It's really good to be able to sort of learn from what we've done and improve it. Um, and we will follow up, obviously, as well by email and signpost those resources. So um, our time is up. Thanks, everyone, for a great session. Thank you.